we're all excited to have Yuli Korch here um, to tell us about his new book, The Next Money Crash and a Reconstruction Blueprint. His book has an impressive list of contributors. And um, I found a nice little introductory review on Amazon, which I'm going to read to you. Uh, to give you an idea of what the book is about if you haven't looked it up yourselves. Uh, the authors demonstrate convincingly that our current monetary system, which relies on the decisions of private banks to create money through creating debt, is increasingly complex, fragile, and at the mercy of these private decisions, and ultimately unsustainable. Korch and his colleagues advocate a return to the monetary system envisioned by many of our founders in which money supply is managed by the sovereign in the interests of the common good. The society they envision and the solutions they advocate will be difficult to achieve, but are essential to contemplate and consider attempting. So I have not had the privilege of reading the book yet. Virginia could hold it up for you all to see. Um, and it's, oh, thanks, John. Oh, oh, we got a few people who bought the book. That's wonderful. Go ahead, Yuli. Tell us, tell us what's going on. Well, to begin with, all of those of you who held the book up, you, you get an extra $100 immediately, you know. Isn't that how it works? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, bad, bad, bad humor to begin with. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, by the way. Thank you, first of all, for, for your time and, uh, and for this time together. I, I assume, first of all, <clears throat> that those of us who are on this call basically come from the same position um, as to what, what Mary just read. One of the, I hadn't even read that review of the book yet, so thank you. That, that was new to me. Now, now, I knew, I'm, now I know what was written. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> So I'm not going to go through a lot of the uh, um, principles that, that we're, we're trying to do there. <clears throat> I want to talk about what the book is all about <clears throat> beyond the economic principles that we're subscribing to. Um, what we're trying to do, what I try to do here is to create a comprehensive overview of our thinking. Um, so often we come at it from just one point. But uh, what I was trying to create is how, how do we create, it's kind of like a textbook. Um, <clears throat> it, it does flow all the way through. I hope, I hope it does I try to get it to do that. So I asked each of the authors to handle a, a particular point, which I felt was, was their part of their major expertise, <clears throat> but to do it in an order that would make some sense uh, sequentially. So, um, you don't have to read the whole book. And, and I say that in, in the introduction, and I think most people who are not into uh, economics or into our mode of thinking will probably not do so. So I'm telling people, read the introduction, read the first section, which are the first three chapters that give an overview of what it's all about. And then hopefully read the last chapter. Uh, it's kind of backwards for most books. I know you're not supposed to do that. Um, <clears throat> so he, here's what, what can be done. And then, then go and pick up the, the different pieces uh, that are presented by the different authors. And you, you'll, you'll notice that a, a number of the authors are not classically um, part of our world of um, just money, uh, and the things that we subscribe. And, and that was very deliberate on my part, but none of them disagree. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I didn't want authors in there that say, no, no, it's all a bunch of garbage, but uh, to give their respective perspective as part of the overall picture. And I mean, the, the, the biggest name in there obviously is, is Bill White, the former chief economist of the Bank for International S Settlements, <clears throat> who uh, maybe still today, I, I don't know, is, um, I know he's, he's back in Toronto. I mean, we're all having um, uh, travel difficulties, but in Paris, the, the OECD, uh, he, he was uh, one of the top people in the OECD. Maybe he's resigned from that also now that he's back in, in Toronto. I, I can't remember. Um, <clears throat> but he is your classical central banker, classical quote. 
he's the only one that I know of that would uh, openly speak against the current system, which is which is why I chose him, um, obviously. Um, <clears throat> saying, look, look, there's serious, serious problems. And his whole chapter is one of the longest chapters in the book. His job, his and John Malden's uh, are about 50 pages each, roughly. Um, <clears throat> and um, give a, a, a uh, critique of the current system from the perspective of a central banker, not only a central banker, from the perspective of you know one of the top people in the bank of international settlements, what, what I call <clears throat> the, the world's central bank of all the central banks. Um, <clears throat> and, and we uh, so often um, are afraid of the opinions of these other people. And I think that's a, that's a downside for us. I remember, um, in, in Switzerland, when I ran a conference there to change the constitution of the country, um, I remember sitting in a train and I had invited, uh, I won't tell you who it is right now, <clears throat> one of the biggest names in the, you would immediately, all of you recognize his name. And, and I was with uh, a, a prominent member of the Swiss delegation. And he was absolutely horrified that I would think of inviting someone like that. And I go, no. <clears throat> there has to be an open dialogue, an open exchange. Uh, I didn't really provide that in the book. The, the book is not a back and forth, the way the conference in Switzerland was, <clears throat> but an attempt for credibility from a number of different voices. And that, that, that really is the, 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 the major point. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was to create a resource um, you know, especially for governments and central bankers, such that in hopefully in one volume, you can get a, a variety of different perspectives and yet they all go in the same direction. So even in the, the last chapter, which, which I wrote, <clears throat> how, to, how to create a whole changeover, um, I, I do give a number of different ways of doing these things because um, there are different perspectives. I mean, I so, so I think you all know, I run the conference here at the Federal Reserve Bank that sort of really sort of put me on the platform kind of idea. And then the one in Switzerland, and then also one in Athens, um, hosted by the, the governor of the, uh, by the, the, um, the chairman of the Bank of, um, of, of Greece. And um, so, so often we are afraid to, to uh, honestly, I don't want to say go head to head, but um, address serious issues with people who are willing to be honest. That doesn't always happen in public. Uh, and, and you know, again, in Switzerland, I ran into some of those problems where in private, uh, people would agree with me. In public, they, they would not. And that, that's, reasonably, that's reasonably typical. I had, I've had several head-to-heads with uh, members of the Federal Reserve here um, in, in the United States. And I remember one instance, especially <clears throat> where I uh, strongly disagreed publicly. Uh, it was a the Federal Reserve as a panel. And, and after they all did their presentations, I stood up and I said, uh, because you know, my primary interest is, is social. How does this affect human beings? Thank you for your um, fancy formulas. Thank you for <laughs> you know, all these other things. But the bottom line is, there are real effects on human beings and on ecology. And uh, we so often refuse to accept those. So I said publicly, I said, let, let, let me tell you, Mr. Federal Reserve, we'll keep names out of this. You, the Federal Reserve Bank, you are the biggest source of inequality in this country. Let me explain to you why. This is what you do. I want to make a bank, a bank, a bank, a bank, a bank, a bank, a bank. And that's exactly what the result is. And he said, whoa, blah, 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 blah. So I want to talk to him afterwards, and I, I'm not saying this to toot my horn, but he says, I just want you to know that was brilliant. <laughs> your, your analysis was absolutely brilliant. He literally used that word. Of course, part of me says, well, don't you think you could have said that in public? No, I, I, I don't expect that. Because, I, you know, I, I understand. <clears throat> um, it, it's, it's like one of the other contributors to the book, or he what did, did not end up becoming a com contributor. But I know he is totally with us. He said to me, he says, Oli, if I write that chapter, I will be fired. 
So we, we, we have to live with these things and yet find voices that are, you know, high enough at that level. And that's why, like Bill White, I really, really appreciate the fact that, that he's willing to step up to the plate and, and be honest. Um, although <laughs> I must confess his initial draft, this is what's in the book, I think is draft three or four. His initial draft was even more hard hitting. You think that draft is hard hitting. I mean, he tears the system apart, but uh, his initial draft actually at the end, his conclusion uh, was stronger, uh, basically saying even, you know, with, with a major crash, um, I personally don't believe we're ever we're, we're going to have the uh, <clears throat> political will to really put you know to put put into place what needs to be done, because there are too many um, <clears throat> segments of society, especially the large banks, which benefit from the current system, and and they're gonna they're gonna fight tooth and nail in order to not see the changes that that we are in favor of. So back, back to the book, I, I don't think there's anything really new in there for any of you. I may be wrong. Uh, you know, you're welcome to ask all sorts of questions afterwards. But I want you to explain that was my point, was credibility and different voices that will provide the framework within which we can operate. So that you, you can give that book to your member of Congress, to your president, to your parliament, to anybody saying, look, these are some of the biggest names in economics. And they are not against what it is that we are advocating. They, they recognize the problems and they believe we need a, a fundamental paradigm shift. Those are Bill White's words uh, for what needs to be done. Or you can go to go to Malden, for instance, and that was really terrible. Uh, Malden, his, um, his chapter started over 80 pages and I said, it's not gonna work, okay. So I got somebody to, to edit it. And he says, what, what do you want? I said, I want you to strip 30 pages out of this. He goes, what? I go, yeah, you've got to rip 30 pages out. How? Well, God bless you. That's your job. That's not my job. Okay. <laughs> I'll put the bike together. You rip out 30 pages. And, and John, you know, bless John. <laughs> he said, okay, it's just as long as I get to read it before you publish it. I said, yeah, yeah, don't, don't worry about it. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, his especially, I mean, his was the only chapter that we, uh, that we really tore apart. Uh, the rest uh, were, were, you know, basically the 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 way you see them. So, um, well, most of them. There's only one real exception. I'll, I'll give the name. I'll, I'm not going to tell you who that was. Um, <clears throat> I think when when we look at um, what it is that we're trying to do. This is what, we, whatever, this is my perspective. This is what we lose track of, the aspect of credibility and the aspect of coming to people where they, they are honestly in, 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 a real, in a real dialogue. And then, then there's the social aspect. Um, I, I was in an economic conference and the, the president of one of the, the, one of the Fed spoke, one of the Fed, Federal Reserve presidents. And, uh, and, and it, was a, it was a really good talk. And halfway through, I don't know, three quarters of the way through, he says, well, and now to you, now to prove to you that I'm a real economist and that all the rest was mathematics. And I'm going, that, that's the world we live in, where, um, you know, to, to prove that you're a real economist, you have to have fancy math. But in my mind, it's the, it's the people. It's the planet. It's a system that that, that we uh, that we live in, and that's why you know. For those of you who have the book, you saw that uh, I I open at the front or the opening quote before the table of contents. I think right right at the beginning is by William Wilberforce, who was the who spent his whole life killing slavery, uh, first in England and then the British Commonwealth, and the final bill was passed. Uh, if I remember correctly, three months before he died. He spent 50 years doing this, right? And the quote says, having heard all of this, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. And that, that, that's what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> now, I would imagine a lot of people don't know who Will, Will, William Wilberforce, that's a mouthful, was, but it was about slavery. 
And I, I think our economic system, now I didn't want it. Our economic system drives us to slavery. There's a lot of people that are enslaved in the system. I didn't want to hit people in the face right up front at the beginning and say, you know, guess what? If you don't know, that's that quote was about slavery. But nonetheless, I think there are enough people who know who Wilberforce was um, that that they will recognize what that quote is really is really all about. Um, you, you can't say you didn't know. And I, I, my hope was that at the end of the book or at the end of the various chapters that you would read, you would honestly be able to say, okay, I understand. You might disagree. You might not like it. You think it's impossible. You might think of all sorts of things, but you can't come back and say, I did not know. Now, that that really that that really was was what was was my point. Um, <clears throat> um, in, in the last chapter, and I mentioned this briefly just just a few minutes ago. Um, so so I look at an, a number of different scenarios, and and I just use people's names um, as to different ways. <clears throat> of turning the system. And some of this applies to different countries. And that's, I deliberately gave different scenarios because even the, the conference I ran in Switzerland, I did not agree with all of the points, all the constitutional points that were made in order to change the system. Um, oh, by the way, if, if, if you're not aware, uh, let, let me give you 30 seconds of background. So Switzerland has a mandatory and binding uh, referendum system. By mandatory, what I mean is if you fulfill certain criteria, then by the constitution of the country, there must be a referendum on this issue. That's the binding part. Uh, that, that, that's the mandatory part, I'm sorry. The binding part is once, if you win the referendum, then the constitution, in, in our case, it was a national con uh, referendum to change the constitution, then that aspect of what the referendum is must be done. It can't go to parliament and parliament say, no, 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 we, we, I know that's what people want, but they're really stupid. They, they don't understand. You can't do that. It's mandatory and binding. We fulfilled all the uh, specifications necessary for the referendum and then had the referendum and we lost. <clears throat> By the way, we hit the front page of the Wall Street Journal. We, I mean, this, this, caused, this caused a major, major hue and cry, okay? Um, <clears throat> we only got 25% of the vote. The, the media, uh, was really bad. Um, I, I don't want to go into the, there were internal battles between us, um, various factions, those of us putting it on and um, whatever decisions were made that I deeply regret. Probably today, <clears throat> pretty well everybody regrets. Uh, um, I, I, I brought the, the largest, the most powerful messaging service in the world to Switzerland and they fired them. They didn't want them. So, okay, fine. You know, I, I can't, I, you know, I, I, I can't, I can't make those kind of decisions. Um, <clears throat> but the reason I bring this up is several weeks after the referendum. So we got 25% of the vote of the referendum. Okay. Several weeks after the referendum, an independent survey was taken. <clears throat> And 80% of the people surveyed, just on the street, et cetera, 80% were in favor of what it is that we're advocating. Bad media campaign. People had no idea. And people never did really understand what this is all about. So we can go back. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. This has happened a number of, number of times where um, a, a, an issue was brought forward that nobody really understood, that nobody ever thought about, and didn't pass. Three years later, the same issue was brought forward again. We were going, well, yeah, okay, well, maybe we should think about this. Didn't pass. Three years later, <laughs> the issue was brought forward again. We were going, you know what? We've got to do this. And it passes. So that's, you got to have a long-term approach. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that, that, will, that will happen again. Um, so the, back to what I was saying about the final chapter. So for instance, uh, here in the US, the, the Federal Reserve Bank is owned by the member banks, but reports to Congress, okay? But, but th there's no public ownership 
it, it's only the banks, the member banks that that own shares in in the Fed. Okay, in Switzerland, it's not. It's I can't remember what the percent, forty six percent or something. It's owned by private individuals. It's an actual stock that that, that trades. Okay, so <clears throat> that changes uh, perspectives um, as to profit loss issues, which on the whole, I would say the federal bank is kind of immaterial. In Switzerland, it's not. Um, <clears throat> then, then you've got uh, differences as to money creation in, in different countries. So I try to address some of those issues in, in such a way, even though I come largely from an American perspective, um, I, I, there's a little bit of Canadian history in there also because of things that, that when, um, <clears throat> when, when Canada joined the BAS, they were forced to make very various changes uh, 50 years ago, something like that. That's about right. Um, but on the whole, it's an American perspective. But, but I wanted to say, look, there are different ways of doing this that end up with essentially the same thing where, where uh, we end up with, uh, to use a term, sovereign money. So um, I, think, um, I think I can finish. Uh, let me have a look at notes here, whatever I haven't said. Uh, oh, the other thing, um, some of us <clears throat> uh, label countries differently. And one of the labels I really like is there are aircraft companies, uh, countries, and there are speedboat countries. And I think what it is that we're advocating will be much easier to create in a speedboat country, a small country, I don't know, Guatemala, New Zealand, you know, uh, different perspectives of where, where you want to look at it. Uh, instead of <clears throat> immediately focusing on the US, I would say because we're the, the behemoth in the global economic system, we're the reserve currency, et cetera. What, whatever, whatever we do rattles the whole world. Um, and, and so I am trying to concentrate on smaller countries instead of uh, on, on the US, because I, I feel uh, on the whole, I think we can get there, have more solid change legislatively, because what we're talking about really demands legislation quicker than, than we can here in the US. And then one final note, um, and I, I think I'll use a name here. Uh, Chris Waller, who's the uh, most recently appointed governor of the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, I was at, at a conference some time ago <clears throat> and uh, he was speaking. And um, <clears throat> he stopped dead in the middle of a stop. It was very unusual. I, I mentioned that in the book too. So I wanna, I, I wanna get him a copy because <laughs> his name's in there. <laughs> um, you know, people, especially people of that caliber, when they're talking, they don't suddenly stop and they just look at you, total quiet. Well, you know, everybody wakes up, whoa, 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 the guy's not talking. And he, and he said, he said, you know, there's a completely different way of running this whole monetary system. And on paper, it looks absolutely fantastic. But there's no model where we can actually test it to see if it works. I want to talk to him afterwards. And um, he's right. Well, we have Guernsey, you know, Guernsey Island. That's kind of a joke. You know, this population of 65 and a half. There's a pregnant woman. That's the half. Pardon me, ladies. So, you know, <laughs> uh, um, you can't really study the Guernsey Islands in order to change the United States. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's really absurd. Um, <clears throat> so he's right. So that's why I'm saying, okay, where are the speed go boat country or countries that we can really influence? There we go. Do you have questions, comments? Yeah, I, I um, have never, it's, it's rare that I hear somebody I agree with so much. <laughs> and um, I, I worked with a, a tax reform group and a city councilman who was brilliant and later became a congressman. He said to me, um, this was to put the taxes on land value. And he said, we have to take this to the Association of Realtors and the Building Owners and Managers Association and the Chamber of Commerce. And I said, well, they're not going to like it because they'll all pay more. And he said, they don't have to like it. They have to respect that it's a sincere proposal and it's not personal against them. And 
I hear you talking to people who are like that, that, that their acquiescence is worth more than, you know, it's easy to talk to the greens and the libertarians. It doesn't take much courage to talk to That's people right. who, yeah. who, whose opinions <clears throat> don't actually matter, but who are more likely to agree with us. The courage comes in talking to the real heavy hitters without whom, you know, the people who could quash this if they take it personally. And so that was, that was the, um, the biggest thing that, that I appreciated in, in what you were saying. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I have a, a um, comment. Ma Mary, you're on mute. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, John. We're going to use a stack system, and it's a little easier just because we're more accustomed to it. If you go to the chat and put your name, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, please, and then I'll try to get you in the order that you do that. So um, John did that, and John's going to ask his question at this time. Go ahead, please. Well, thank you, Lee, for putting the book together. Uh, it's an interesting volume, and uh, for the reasons that you've already articulated, it brings together some different viewpoints, but all superimposed on, on, on views that say something has to change with regard to the monetary system. Uh, and uh, in, in, in my view, there are only sort of four parts of the book, four authors that really address uh, the question of, of what we could change to. Um, several of the others focused on what was wrong with the system, uh, and that's needed. Uh, but the four, of course, are, are uh, your parts, plus Huber, plus Macmillan, and, and Kotlikov. Uh, and those are specific proposals. And I think one of the things that we really need to explore, that I feel the need of exploration is, is sort of the comparison of those and how we can understand they might, uh, they might affect the, the entire economy if put into to place. And, and I'll pose one question that has been in my mind for some time, and I don't know whether uh, you or, and others may want to take a crack at answering it, but um, the, uh, 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 those of us in the Alliance and come, for, come from AMI, of course, are almost used as a starting point of our thinking, the NEED Act, uh, and uh, uh, Macmillan, of course, published in his book, uh, The End of Banking, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, a different proposal simply because he said uh, the need act type, and he didn't use that phrase in his book. He referred to the positive money solution, which at that time was kind of like the need act. They've changed a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in, in any case, uh, what he argued was that if you just focus on reforming the banks, as Kotlikov does, for instance, and the NEED Act does, then you don't limit where all this other money creation is occurring in shadow banking. Right. And I think a lot of us struggle with this issue because we've seen different authors say different things about this. We've seen Richard Werner, you know, publish an article that says, no, only banks create money, and shadow banks basically are using that money to extend credit, but they're not creating money. And Huber says, well, no, there's some money creation with the mutual funds and so on. Um, uh, but uh, it, it, the, and, and the, 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 the strategy, of course, of Macmillan is very interesting. He says, well, the regulatory system, the banking system is too complicated to regulate, and what we need is a simple rule, and he gives a solvency rule, which he gives in his chapter in, in your book. And, and, the, and the, uh, uh, my two questions really are this, one about the solvency rule and one about the NEED Act. The one about the solvency rule is, doesn't it, be, if, if you require essentially all the lending to occur out of, uh, out of uh, equity, then you basically said there isn't any leverage. You can't borrow to lend further. And right. it seems to me that has an enormous impact on the way things are done in the whole shadow banking world. It kills it. And so how do you think about that when you think about, you know, introducing such a system? And I'd like to hear more commentary on that one. And the other one I'd like to hear more commentary on is the question of whether or not 
the Need Act's provisions of making banks essentially take full risk for their lending, which is very much intrinsic to the Need Act, whether that wouldn't limit essentially what happens later on in the shadow banking system in terms of what's done with the money. In other words, is it really true what, what Macmillan says that, that uh, the Need Act would have little or no constraint on, on shadow banking? Those are my two questions. And you wanna talk about either one of them or both, please? <laughs> oh, they're, they're, they're very related, obviously. Um, let, let me help you with Macmillan, first of all. It's, uh, um, that's a pseudonym. They use yeah. it because they would be fired if people knew who they were. So it's George Gamma and Jörg Miller, they're both really good friends of mine. Um, I, I've, had, <laughs> I've had way too many beers with them. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> they're, they're great people, <clears throat> um, very, very smart. Uh, I did not um, strongly, in, in the final chapter where I'm saying, how do we do all this? I did not strongly advocate going all the way with their proposal uh, for the simple reason, and I may be wrong, that I feel it's so radical uh, that the probability of it passing is a lot less. Now, maybe I'm more of an incrementalist. Um, uh, I remember years ago, a very good friend of mine said to me, Uli, that's not how it works. You've got to incrementalize this. And I said, well, you, you, you can't. It's kind of like pregnancy. You either is or you ain't. There's no woman that's half pregnant, okay? But I, I started thinking about this and I think, no, no, actually, no, we, we can incrementalize. Um, we, we, we can take, go step by step. Well, certainly here in the US, you know, these days you can't pass anything really major. Well, we just passed a $1.9 trillion bill, so maybe I'm wrong. But um, <clears throat> on the whole, that, that, that's really, really difficult. So, so that's why I didn't, it, it's in my final chapter. I go, I go back to their chapter, McMillan's chapter. Um, but I don't say that's really what you got to do. I have it at the end. I'm saying, yeah, you, you, you can do this and it's going to have all these implications. Um, <clears throat> to, to continue on your questions, um, if we only control the banking system, which is by and large what I think most of us suggest, what Kotlikoff suggests, what, what I also suggest, uh, I have to admit, does not solve the shadow banking problem. I, I, I totally agree with that. So uh, I, I, I haven't seen the article by, by Richard Vanna um, that you're referring to, I, I'd like to see that. I mean, he's that guy's really smart. He's a good man. I like him very much. Um, <clears throat> the I was of that opinion also until a few years ago. Uh, and and the the shadow banking problem, the way I'll just use the words the the their pseudonym McMillan um, suggest, it's a combination of a of a, a multiple linking of balance sheets and digitization. You have to have both of those. Uh, let's, let's start with the digitization. The reason is that legally we could have done what the shadow banking system does. We could have done it 50 years ago, except it, it really wasn't pop, it wasn't practical. It would take way too much time. And today with computers, we can shoot this stuff around the world and uh, where the liability on one balance sheet can be an asset on the next. And you move that along and ultimately you are creating money. Um, and that's really their point. Uh, th their point is, is we have come to the stage in our, um, I was gonna say banking capacity, but you see I'm, that, that's wrong because it's a bank, in our uh, uh, digital capacity <clears throat> to link balance sheets in such a way that we, 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 we start with thoughts or a hard asset and we end up with new money. And uh, their, their point <clears throat> with what it is that, that on the whole we are suggesting is that's not enough. And yeah, I, I actually, I really do think they're right. Um, but that's a heck of a lot better than what we got right now. That's really my point. Uh, most, most of the money is still created uh, through our classical banking system. And a lot of that 
I agree with Richard Vanna for what it is that you're saying, does move into the into a shadow banking system or into a, 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 a mutual fund kind of a system. But that's all equity based. Um, <clears throat> But that that isn't the totality of the story. I I, I really I really don't believe it is. Uh, um, and your other question was ah the need act. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think it'll control that. Uh, I, I mean, it's been several years. I've read it multiple times over you know over a period of years. Uh, but um, I don't believe I, I I would agree with Mike Bill on this particular case. I don't believe it would uh, control it. Even if, um, I mean, with our securitization system today, I, I recognize the fact that banks can, you know, by the time they're finished, they, they own next to nothing other than servicing rights. <coughs> uh, but but it, it still isn't a total control. But oh my goodness, it's so much better than what we currently have. So that's, I, I'm sort of saying, okay, you guys, could we just really improve the system? I may be wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Alec had a question. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. The issue of a radical uh, and um, uh, in incrementalism, um, I think it matters a great deal how incremental you are going to be because if you're too incremental, then you won't be alive to make any decisions at all. We agree. <laughs> yeah. You're right. <laughs> So that, and I use the term radical uh, in its original term of going to the source of the problem. Yes. So incrementalists tend to then go for symptomatic relief rather than uh, change that is systemic. So the question then comes back to one, well, how long would you be waiting in order to get the kind of results that you want? You know, with the women's movement, for example, to get the vote, it took 50 years. Uh, with uh, uh, voting legislation, it took uh, 10 years, etc. Well, the environmentalists tell us that we have 10 years to produce a, a redirection of the economy a systemic change in the economy. So uh, that's the concern. I don't uh, necessarily disagree with you. It just matters how incrementalist one is and when will one say, no, that's too much to, to wait. Good, good question. Uh, I, I totally agree with you that if incrementalism means um, just taking care of symptoms, Yes, that's, that's total. I totally agree with you. That's that's garbage. That, let's not yes. do that. Um, the incrementalism that I mentioned in my final chapter, nothing goes more than two years. OK, so okay. Uh, let, let's, let's talk about banking for, for a minute. <clears throat> so my suggestion on the banks is. Um, let's start voluntarily. So so we what we do is here are the new rules. I'm, I'm talking about Kotlikoff in this particular case, where we mutualize uh, all of the aspects of the bank, but it's too much of a shock in the system instantly. So we, we will start on a voluntary basis and then slowly increase the equity levels at which this must be, at this, which point this becomes mandatory, maximum two years for the whole process. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so th that's what I meant by incrementalism. Um, okay. Now, I, hang on, I am excluding uh, what, 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 what John Howell just mentioned. The, um, <clears throat> I'm excluding the shadow banking part of that. Um, and well, actually that's not totally true either. Uh, I incrementalize that also. That's right, I forgot about that. <laughs> where, where, where I'm saying, again, over a two year period of time, we slowly, uh, increase the relative percentages of financial and non-financial assets until ultimately we get to to 100% non-financial assets. At which point, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, solvency solvency rule is in place. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that makes quite the difference. Saying what we mean by uh, by 
two years versus 10 years or indefinite amount of time. Yeah, yeah. that's with, a really good point. Thing, that's a really good point. With, with respect to the Swiss referendum, I, I wonder whether it was about the, this, uh, the ratio of the highest to the lowest income being 12 to one. That was a referendum that was defeated in Switzerland you know, for incomes in Switzerland. But uh, that was the result of setting it at 12 to one. People didn't have a choice to let's say 20 to one or 15 to one. And they might have won if they uh, had a choice to say 20 to one would be the discrepancy. So it depends very much on the voting system that you choose to make decisions. And uh, and uh, I've come across in the last year or so or less to something called the system consensus proposal that um, is a voting system that I find very, very attractive because you get consensus very, very early and very quickly because you vote uh, only for things that you're very much against not necessarily for things that you are opposed, that, yes, uh, that you are in favor of. And so the consensus gets to be much easier. And I wonder if in order to avoid conflicts amongst ourselves, as you mentioned earlier with others, that we might uh, look into that way of making decisions as to how we proceed uh, and uh, with what capacities. Thank you. Can, can I can I get back to Switzerland just for I'm sorry Mary is that is that okay? Um, a, a a point of interest. Thank thank you, Alec. A point of interest that may bring some clarity. I I think we all know that basically nobody understands what we're talking about. <laughs> you know, let's talk about the U.S. It's probably the one percent of the population of the country actually knows what we're talking about. So. This is what actually happened in Switzerland. Um, the law, I, I told you, there's a whole bunch of steps that has to be gone through yes. before the referendum it becomes mandatory, okay? Yes. Before it has, to, it has to occur. One of the things is it has to be discussed in parliament. Are you ready? You're not gonna believe this. <laughs> the length of discussion, there were two items for discussion in parliament that particular day. One was our proposal. They spent 15 minutes, one five minutes talking about it. And they spent two hours talking about how long the horns on a cow should be. I am not kidding you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> In case we wondered if it's all a little crazy. Um, yeah. yeah, that's right. Hobart, Hobart is next and then Mark and then Dan. Uh, Yuli, thank you so much for uh, this talk and putting this book together. Um, I invited you, so uh, I took the trouble to read the whole thing, and I am very... Oh, oh, oh poor. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, I love reading. You can see that from behind. That's not a fake yes. picture. That's, yes. that's books. Um, what do I want to uh, bring up here? Um, actually... The crash, so the, the main title is the next money crash. Uh, there were two things that stuck with me. Um, first of all, actually, there was not much talk about crash in, in, in the whole book. But what was said was, uh, you know, chilling. Um, I think Malden and White were pretty uh, uh, strong about that, saying yes, yes. this system is so unstable and it's so unpredictable, it, it's hard to say, you know, when indeed it will happen. And that's a very strong point you also make. Yeah. It's almost like it will happen, but we don't know when. Right. But it was not, you know, it was not that much uh, elaborated uh, further. Um, the only other thing where it really came into picture was with Molden giving some practical uh, indication what to do. How did you like? Did you like it, the train crash picture? That's a real picture, you know. 
unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Well, and those are the chilling metaphors that that you know, if you take it serious, uh, you know, it's like, ooh, oops, oops, oops. So um, his his, and I, I'd like you to to explain a little more, you know, uh, about possible crash and what your sense is, also from you know uh, the contributors. Uh, but yeah, Molden is saying it's coming, but it's also an incredible opportunity. You know, if you get out yes. of paper money, paper assets uh, uh, stuff, and you position yourself with, you know, either gold or, you know, I positioned myself with gold in 2006 and I reaped a great profit. <laughs> so I, I, I feel, you know, that, 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 that is possible. Um, so what, what would you recommend? And what else would you like to share about, you know, this, this doomsday scenario? Um, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <clears throat> thank you, Gord, for inviting me. <laughs> um, so uh, w one of the reasons for that title, it, it's a follow up from my first book, which was also called The Next Money Crash and Dash How to Avoid It. So the, the, the point, that's a conference I ran at the Federal Reserve Bank. The point is, let's not have one of these, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have to have one of these. This is what we can do. And I'm afraid in the meantime, already at that time, a bunch of people told me, by the way, starting with Kotlikov, he says, Oli, you're a Pollyanna. You're, you're way too positive. We will, we will never, excuse me, enact these changes. We're going to have a crash. And I said, no, no, come on, man. You know, come on, come on. Uh, you know, good friend of mine, come on, <laughs> don't give me that. <laughs> no, 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 we can do this. Well, slowly, slowly, I became more and more negative. No, we're not going to do it. So that's number one. So I wanted to follow up on the prior book by moving part of that part of the title across. The, 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 the second thing is that, that in our, um, you know, we're not down to microseconds anymore. We're down to nanoseconds. We can have a crash, easy a crash in, in half an hour. We can have a crash in one hour. I mean, I mean you know, you, you've seen some of the blow ups that have happened over, over the last few years, especially on the stock market. This can happen so quickly where there's a loss of confidence. <clears throat> and, and then, okay, I know we have, uh, we have uh, circuit breakers in the, in the stock market today where what, you get a certain percentage to drop and automatically everything shuts down. But then it has it opens up again, and if shuts down again, opens up again, shuts down again. Let me tell you, at that point, all hell breaks loose, and that can happen in a very very short time. So, um, and, and I, I do believe that the biggest issue is debt. Uh, I, I know a lot of people, a lot of people, a certain small number of people, think that debt doesn't matter. It, it does, for the simple reason our money creation process today is dependent on an increase in debt, which is dependent on private individuals and corporations willing to take out loans. One of the reasons we cannot up our GDP growth under the current situations and why we are stuck on this, you know, it used to be 120 volt, now it's 240 volts. I tell you pretty soon it's gonna be 660 volts. And, and one of these days it's gonna be 120,000 volts and the whole system will blow up because we, we, we operate on a debt system whereby we want people to increase their debt and people do not want to increase their debt. And that stops money growth and that stops production and it, it goes up and it doesn't gently go down. At some point, it'll go up and it goes like this. That, that's the issue. Um, at that point, you know, is it, uh, it inflationary or deflation? That's a really good question. Probably most of us sitting here think it's inflationary. I'm not totally convinced. Every American crash over the last 150 years has been deflationary, not inflationary. Um, so it's not that it's not just kind of that obvious. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I'm answering your uh, your, your 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 questions or not. Um, <laughs> How are you positioning yourself <clears throat> from a, from a personal perspective? Yeah, in, in abstract terms. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, I have money in gold, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm not a, I'm not a gold um, freak or you know whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I I think most likely it will be inflationary because of the debt levels just keep on going crazy. Uh, so therefore, what you want to do is is um, 
you know, but bottom line in all those kinds of situations is, is assets, hard, not paper assets, hard assets. Um, I, I remember I was in Argentina during their huge crash down there. And um, the moment the moment you got any money, you go out and buy anything. It doesn't matter what it is. You buy a washing machine. It doesn't matter what it is. And then the next day you can sell it. You, you buy a thing, not paper. Um, and uh, because it, it's going to be okay. And I remember when I first got down there, I figured, man, this is really weird. What? Well, I'm, I'm going out to buy whatever is still in the store. I'm going to buy it. Doesn't matter what it is. Wow. Um, I remember that they, they struck two zeros off the currency. And um, I, had, I had smaller kids at the time. I, I, I walked by a children's toy store. And they had one of those official price sets. You know, they're not that big. And I'm looking at the price and I'm saying, it's, is it $12 or is it $125? Neither of those made any sense, but that was the price. I, I kid you not, I remember standing there, little official price thing. Well, what, what, what's the actual price? Because I had, I had both currents, because they still had the old currency. And, um, you know, you, you have to sort of, in the new currency, you have two zeros missing. And I'm going, so what? Neither of those prices made any sense. I don't get it. I mean, really? $125 for the Fisher pricing? $12? No, it doesn't make any sense. You know, so I don't know. I walked away. I thought, I don't get it. <laughs> but the, that's the insanity of what can happen in a very short period of time. Wow. Thank you. Ed Tuig, you've been waiting patiently. I would like to, we all want to hear your question. You need to unmute, Ed. Yeah. There, have you got my voice now? Yes. Sir. Okay. Thank you, sorry. Uh, we, we vote for people one vote at a time and that elects our government. Our government is then charged with looking after our commons equally for all people. And yet when we come to the creation of money, it should also be created equal to all people. Whereas now, some people get quite a lot of that money that's created and other people get very little of it. So what we should have is all money created by government. We should have the sovereign money all created by government and it was just by nature would be equally for all people, but then when it goes into the private sector after we have paid for the commons, after the government has paid for commons, the money that goes into the private sector should all go in in the form of loan to the private sector at interest so that the people who are getting a small amount of the money created uh, for their own use is paid by those who have a large amount of the money created. How does that fit into your uh, money creation theory. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Let, 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 let me start. You know, I can't get away from my humor. You, you, you don't understand. We are all equal. It, it's the Greek equality system that what they said was we are all equal, but some of us are more equal than others. So one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> um, in, again, in the last chapter, um, when I go through a number of different scenarios and, 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 and different people have different ideas. So Michael Kumal, for instance, suggests one thing. Um, the, the need act suggests something different. Um, over, the, over the years, uh, the, not that many years, let's say over the last five years, I, I've slowly um, shifted my opinion. <clears throat> and uh, because um, Maybe I shouldn't say that in this public, but I, 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 I'm maybe I'm becoming more American. You know, I didn't grow up. I only become American citizen, you know, a few years ago, and um, um, I just don't trust government as much anymore as I used to. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying it. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> what I'm now suggesting is that either every citizen or every taxpayer, and and I, I. I don't know how to judge the difference between those two systems. Gets a check every quarter. And that check is 
what replaces our current money system methodology through debt creation. Okay, that, that's what I'm suggesting at, at the end of the book. Um, it, will, it will slowly decrease inequality. It, it will not be instant, but it slowly decrease any inequality. Um, and then after that, the system basically works the same way. The people who work harder will make more money. The people who are smarter will make more money. But everybody, and it's not a UBI, it's not a universal basic income, because it varies. You, you don't know what you're going to get the next quarter. But you get an equal distribution of everything. And I've got a fancy formula in there, which uh, might some, drive some of you crazy. I did back test it for a few years ago. Uh, that it, it actually works. Uh, and and in, in my book, I, I try to be very careful. I, I'm trying to say, this is not the way it has to be. Here's a way of thinking about it. Here's a formula, and I break the whole thing apart as to how to do it. And every either citizen or taxpayer gets a check every quarter. <clears throat> Equivalent to the money creation that is needed, taking velocity in effect, for the change in, in, in GDP. Um, <clears throat> and then... And, and government is fed strictly by taxes, fees, and fines. You know, no, all the solve, all, all, all the seniorage goes to the people, not, not to the government. The government gets it secondarily through taxes, and there are other ways of collecting, but but not seniorage. And that I I was really against that. I, I gotta tell you, I was really, let's say seven, ten years ago, I was really against that. The more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what? There's still, I see too many cases. And in the um, decision-making chapter that I wrote, uh, it's a talk I gave at the, the AMI several years ago. Um, I give all sorts of examples where the system was terribly skewed in both directions by politics. Ter terrible decisions. And we have absolute hard proof of that. We have recording, voice recordings, we have letters. We have, we have absolute hard hardcore where this was done. And I'm saying, okay, so when I saw that more and more, I said, you know, we're going to give this all this money to the government. You got to be kidding me. So uh, I, that's. Okay, um, thank you. That I would like to suggest that uh, you try to get a, a money change system in Canada because we did have uh, basically government created money up until 1974. I know. And that we have it no longer, but we do have a great government debt since that since that time. And so get over here across the border and straighten us out first, will you? Well, you know, I'm I I'm still a Canadian citizen, so oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Mark Young, did you have a question? Uh, yes I did. Um Yuli, back to your, uh, your first comment. Uh, one was regarding um, talking to people that, uh, that you don't necessarily, you don't think would agree with you. And uh, your conversation saying that if it's just you two having a beer, they'll be honest with you. But if uh, you're in a public audience, um, they won't. So I, I, my, my, my first question is, what do you think would take to change that? Is that something that's where a grassroots movement is needed, where if there are a million people in the street demanding monetary reform, do you think they would speak the truth then? When it, does it, is there a, like a demarcation line where you'd have to go over this line before they start being honest with the people they're talking to about, um, about the system change that's needed? That's the first question. The second question is, do you think if the referendum in Switzerland or any of the other small nations you talked about as far as starting in a smaller area, if they were to pass monetary reform, what do you think would be the response of the United States or, or the international finance community? Do you think they would institute financial sanctions? Do you think they would just let it go um, and see what happens? Um, so just curious, thanks. Um, first of all, as, as far as a, a broad, yeah, I, I, I do agree. We we need more of a broad understanding. I, I think, again, I may be wrong. I, I would say 80% of that is education. So back to the messaging service that I brought on for Switzerland, I said to the head guy, I said, you know, if I had $10 million, I just gave you $10 million. And you know what I ask you to do? All I want you to do 
is teach the average American that money is created through debt. That's all. You don't have to do anything else. Just that one fact. And that will lead to questions. And people say, what? I thought the Federal Reserve creates all our money. I thought beats me, whatever. I thought banks just circulate money. I thought, I thought all sorts of things. Just teach them that debt creates money. <clears throat> That's all. And then we'll go on for the next step. Maybe I'll need another $20 million after that. You know, I don't know. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think there's a grassroots pressure <clears throat> that, 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 that needs to be there. Uh, back to a small, a, a small country changing. Yes. I, I believe there will be pressure, especially from the bankers, um, especially from large, you know, let, let's say HSBC or Santander, you know, some of the large city, some of the large global banks, when they start having to operate in that country, they're, they are going to create the pressure. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly, fairly sure of that. Um, <clears throat> but I think that can be withstood. Uh, it's gonna take some work. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, I, yeah, I mean, all, all, you know, why haven't we seen these changes since, you know, 1935? I mean, it's not that this stuff's new, uh, but, but we haven't seen it active. And uh, so that's a, that, that's, a, that's a real possibility. Um, Just a, a where, quick follow-up. Do you think that, um, I, I understand a bank's opposition to it. Um, but like you said, the United States being the holder of the reserve currency, basically the master of the financial system, they can put financial um, sanctions on countries themselves. You as the United States. And, oh, absolutely. They have. They have done it. My question is, I don't know, do you think they would do it in that case? So not just the banks, but would it would make I'm thinking, because you're wondering. <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm not convinced the government would, uh, but I think the, the, the IMF, I don't think the World Bank, but I think the IMF and the Fed uh, would put some pressure on. Would they take it to the point of disallowing SWIFT, for instance, cutting them off like, like we've done with Russia, et cetera, uh, where we've politicized SWIFT um, which uh, personally, I think is a terrible decision. That's my personal opinion. Um, the IMF, I, I, I think would, would, would put pressure on, I, um, I, I, I think so. And um, it would be necessary uh, for that country to make sure that they've got good relationship with neighbors, et cetera, whereby we can move things. I mean, I, I don't want them to switch over to the new Chinese system that's being set up to, uh, you know, the Chinese and the Russians got together to get rid of SWIFT, so they don't have to have SWIFT. Um, but we, we are creating more um, digital methodologies of moving money today that are not dependent on SWIFT that, that I've been involved in, whereby some of those could be activated quite quickly. Um, I know uh, I was dealing with a major Middle Eastern country, for instance, on uh, money money movements, uh, not using SWIFT, uh, very substantial sums, like huge sums. Um, there are still KYC issues, et cetera, that you have to legally deal with. Um, but the capacity to do that outside of uh, uh, mind you, there's there's uh, this Alliance Light. They probably would shut that down too. Um, yeah, there, 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 there'd be constraints. There's no doubt about it. Um, so there would have to be a also a group of sophisticated international uh, bankers. I shouldn't use the word bankers. People who would be willing to help. Who are sophisticated technologically, who can then um, do those kinds of things. Otherwise, all, you know, all trades shut down. I mean, uh, you know, without Swift, I mean, you finish. You know, so. Thank you. Dan has another question. Um, yeah, I, I uh, 
<laughs> amazed at how much I agree with you. Um, the the money has to go to the people because, and it can go to the people in reductions in their payroll taxes or anything. Um, but it has to go to the people because government runs on an annual budget and you don't know a year ahead of time how much money you can inject. So, um, so I, I much agree with that. I was thinking about shadow banking and it occurred to me that you could treat shadow banking the way you treat a foreign currency. That, um, you know, if you have, if, you, if Canada, if somebody in Canada has a bank account and they, then somebody deposits US dollars in the Canadian bank account, they immediately, can, they immediately exchange it for Canadian money because it's not really money in their bank if it's not Canadian money. And I think you could have AIG money and AIG money would be like a foreign currency. You can have that, but you cannot commingle it with Canadian money. In other words, it's you, and if AIG's credit worthiness rises or falls, or they inflate or deflate the amount of AIG money, that would come back on the on AIG rather than coming back on on the country that where people are trying to use that AIG money. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The, that, 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 that's definitely possible. The problem is when you're talking in the billions or on a national basis, it becomes so complicated. You know, you, you've got to you've got to simplify the system as much as possible. Well, I, as long as it's as long <clears throat> as it's a bigger problem for AIG than it is for us, they will behave <laughs> responsibly. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. So. Joe Polito, you had a question too. I do. I have lots of questions, <laughs> but but I'll stick to one theme here. <clears throat> um, uh, Henry George is most famous for talking about the economic rent situation and, and fixing that. And, you know, I haven't read your book. I intend to. But basically, I think the whole monetary reform movement is another kind of um, uh effort to remove economic rent. Only instead of monopolizing the bank, <clears throat> we've got private institutions monopolizing money. Um, and you're talking about an incremental removal of that monopoly and getting that those funds in the hands of the people and the people's representatives um, and doing it incrementally. So, uh, I'm just thinking about this idea of incrementalism in two ways, and I, I want to know what your reaction is. One is that for the last 14 years, uh, the central banks have been putting, well, the Federal Reserve, I think it's something like $9 trillion has been added to its yeah. balance sheet. That sounds like a, an incremental move to kind of a greenback sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> I think it's actually a lot more than that, but they've They've had to hold on to the nine trillion and it will never come off. Um, and um, this, we seem to be headed rapidly toward a central bank digital currency. And um, Michael Kumoff has said, yeah. sorry? Yeah, uh, no, yeah. No, go on, yes, yeah. Uh, and said, uh, Michael Kumoff has said that that one change would take us a long way to narrow banking and uh, government and people control of uh, money and taking away, you know, moving us away from a debt-based system. Um, and I think he had in mind, and others have said, basically the governments would be getting more and more of the uh, funding through the digital currency and they would slowly replace incrementally the bank money which is where they're getting the money now. Um, <clears throat> so um, could you talk a little bit about central bank uh, digital currency and uh, the incrementalism that maybe has taken? Let me uh, tell you a funny uh, story. Um, uh, several years ago, there were a group of top level bankers, Fed, People sitting around having a 
fancy dinner with very expensive wine. And um, after a few glasses of wine, one of them said, this is real, you guys. I am not making this up. One of them said, so, um, you know, all, all, all the money, you know, on the balance sheet of the Fed, what would happen if we mark it down to zero? Everybody look at everybody else. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, don't know. I don't know what would happen. I don't know. That was the end of the conversation. I can't kid you not. <laughs> uh, that's all. That's also very scary. There, there are there are there there are implications. Uh, CBDC, um, central bank digital currency, C CBDC. Um, the punchline. Repeat the punchline. We didn't quite get. Oh, I'm so, I'm sorry. The the the, the punchline. Everybody kind of said, I don't know what would happen. No idea. <laughs> it wouldn't have any huge impact. Um, you know, my point is long term, it would have in inflationary impact if we're going to keep on doing that. But in the immediate, in the right now, yeah, I, I don't think there would be an impact. And and sitting around the dinner table, and, and it was, there were, uh, let's say, 12 to 15 people sitting around the table. This wasn't a little two or four people, okay? Private conversation, but uh, anyway. <laughs> uh, CBDC. Um, I, I agree that, that CBDC would um, solve a lot of technical issues. Uh, I am really afraid of CBDC, I have to admit, I, I really am. Uh, when I look at what China is doing and their uh, social, what do they call it, social index, so you get rated, did you jaywalk across the street? That's minus one point. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know. Do you swear with well, a minus two? No, I don't know. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, they've got all these different things, and so China is further ahead than any other country as far as CBDC is concerned. I mean, there's the eChrono and there's you know systems in Canada. Canada had, had an interbank uh, um, CBDC that they ended up testing, but the the possibility of control. I don't think it's right. The probability of control is, I think, is just beyond. They, the people, people in the government will not be able to keep their hands off the control function. That's my fear. Um, maybe I'm paranoid. You know, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not after me. Uh, it's my standard line. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And I have never seen a system whereby it is impossible to not dig down into an individual. There's a number of different CBD ways of doing it. You can concentrate it, you, you know, you can have the banks handle it, and then the bank simply in bulk every night, whatever transfer totals back and forth. And so the central bank, in theory, never sees whose money it is, in theory. But there's no way of stopping if the FBI or the federal government insists that the central bank drill down into somebody's account. There is no way of electronically stopping that. that that's my point. Um, so, yes, technically, it's a wonderful solution. Um, really, really wonderful solution. Um, and, and there's a difference between what can be done today versus what can be done with CBDC. CBDC is direct, constant control and oversight versus, yes, uh, the, uh, the the FBI or whatever can go into your bank account today. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that. But it's not this, con CBDC is a millisecond by millisecond control of whether you bought cigarettes or whether you bought a car or the new dress. Right, right. I have a feeling there's a lot of sympathy for that fear in this in this group. Virginia, what's your question? Oh, microphone. Thank you. Um, we just uh, attended the annual meeting of the international movement for monetary reform this past weekend. 
and um, it's still fledging and developing its wings. Uh, when you when you mentioned you thought it it's would be what you call them the speedboat country that would be the best place the wedge. Um, so who's on that list? Who should we be out? Um, you know, sending missionaries to 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 spread the word. Um, basically, basically smaller countries that are clean or as clean as possible. Um, and where, by, by smaller, I mean populations in the, let's say under 10 million, low single millions, okay. Uh, New Zealand, I mentioned New Zealand, New Zealand really comes to mind. Um, they, have, they have been, uh, over the last several decades, they have initiated a number of different reforms that have gone around the whole world. For instance, the, the goal, the 2% inflationary goal, which I don't agree with, but th th that's, that's a different point. Th that came from New Zealand. Um, and, and they're the first, they, they instituted that by themselves and it spread today, it's basically in the whole Western world, okay. Um, Guatemala, I mean, I've met with several Guatemalan presidents, the former Minister of Economics is a friend of mine, the current, I've had multiple meetings with the current Minister of Economics. So there is a possibility. The problem is uh, politically, the country is just, ah, you know. Um, so um, so then, then, then you get into, into countries where those kind of switches are easier to make like uh, let's say more in the Arabic countries where, where it, you have a sheikh or a, uh, you know, et cetera. But then how relevant is, he is able to make those kind of decisions very easily. How relevant is that to situations that are more, more um, democratic? So you, you sort of, it, it's, a, it's a mishmash where I'm looking for small countries, clean, good relationships that for one reason or another, uh, I, I might have. Um, I don't know if that's right. List. That was a short list. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, 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 I know. Yeah. Um, I, I have been dealing very extensively with the Saudi government recently, but um, I, I just, I, I really don't like what's happening. So really don't like what's happening. So. Julie, I'll ask you a question because that sweet review I read when I introduced you talked about how uh, the language in this book is clear and understandable for people, and that I understood to be one of your goals, too, that we're trying to talk to more people than each other. Can you give us a little demo of how to talk to people about shadow banking? Like in, in a couple of minutes, how do you start somebody with um, what it is and why it matters? It's really easy, as you can tell, because my instant was instant. Oh, I no, was an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. Anybody else? No. <laughs> um, it starts with our accounting system, the 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 uh, the the ledger system that we use of you know uh, liabilities and and, and assets. And the fact that the, the, that balance always has to exist. And the fact that we can move that across the different countries, uh, uh, companies, I'm sorry. And we can now do that digitally. That is the essence of the shadow banking system. But you mean our ledger, are you talking national government ledgers or are you no, talking bank corporations, ledgers? corporations, corporations, corporations ledgers. Yes, corporations, sorry, yes. Uh-huh, okay, is that clear to everybody? Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm going to run out um, and tell all my friends. <laughs> um, the, the, um, all right. But, uh, see, then it gets a little longer. So, um, <clears throat> if, I if I have a house and I want to get a mortgage, <clears throat> but I don't go to a bank because this keeps bank it keeps bank out of this okay because the shadow banking is not the real banking okay so I, I have a house and mary i want to borrow money from you so i borrow a hundred thousand dollars from you okay. okay that is a liability to me it's an, an asset to you all right okay 
You then take that asset and you go to a hedge fund and you say to the hedge fund, I have an asset of $100,000. What will you give me against it? And the hedge fund said, I'll give you an 80% line of credit because that coach dude, he's, he's, he's really good on paying his debts. Oh, that would not be nice. <laughs> um, and um, so what we'll do is, is we will give you ownership in, a, in an equity-based mutual fund because you have equity. Uh -huh. And that equity-based mutual fund now is, is able to move that into a debt situation. And by the time you're finished, that chain ends up being actual money into this final company. Okay. The so witch, the final company? Into the final company, uh -huh. exactly. So what started off as a private loan on a mortgage, because it's a solid asset, ends up ultimately increasing the money supply. And that used to be basically impossible, okay? Um, but we can do it, it the, the, the digital aspect, the computer aspect of it is absolutely, absolutely impossible, absolutely material. Without it, we, we can't do it because we, we can't transfer that paperwork. Can you imagine in the past, you've got to mail it, you have to prove it, your signature is real. No, no, today it's all like, it's electronic. Boom, gone. Okay. All right, that is very helpful. I, I appreciate that. And if someone wants to make a little follow-up question about exactly that, we could do that. Otherwise, Lucille has a different question and then Paul and then Joe. Anybody want to follow up on this uh, how to make shadow banking simple conversation or shall we move on? Go ahead, Lucille. Okay, I saw John Howell moving. I thought he might be moving to his speaker. <laughs> okay, um, so Uli, I actually, nice to see you here. Thank you for being here. Um, and my question goes back to your prior comment about um, central bank digital currency and how invasive it sounds like you think it is of our private affairs, commercial affairs. And so I wanted to ask you if you can explain um, how can it be so invasive? And then how and what, why, why or how must it be? So how can it be? And then is there no way to prevent it from being that invasive um, other than <laughs> blockchain technology, which I understand is really not scale upable um, for a whole system? Yeah. No, it doesn't work for the whole system. Um, let me answer your last question first. Um, I mean, the only way to stop that is to have really open government and open, honest discussions and all the, the kind of framework that in theory that, that, that we have, okay? That, that's, that's the only way to stop it because electronically, I don't believe you can stop this. So the, the, the stopping has to be through an, an, an open, uh, process and the problem is the open process has been so abused that um, that I don't have a lot of faith um, in, in that and um, okay yeah, I'm gonna be really personal here so I fly into Israel big airplane Mossad comes on board Everybody stays on the airplane. You know who gets pulled off? Me. Okay. Um, I have a bad history. You know, there was a uh, uh, recently a uh, treasury security meeting. One of the people in the meeting was a friend of mine. And they go through all the, this is happening internationally. It's happening over here. It's happening up here. It's happening over here. And the person from treasury running the meeting at the end of the meeting says, I only have one question. Anybody here, any, any of you guys know this guy called Uli Korch? I got a phone call afterwards from my friend said, I just want you to know, there's only one name that was brought up. So just because I'm paranoid, doesn't mean they're not after me. Maybe they are though, that's the problem. 
I, I can give you more stories. But I thought those two would be would be enough. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't live in paranoia. I actually I, I actually have a very high trust in the government, generally speaking. Um, and, and I think most of the people generally desire to do right. The, 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 the problem that there becomes a, you know, a pervasive attitude, <clears throat> which starts with, I wanna do right, to I wanna serve well, to yeah, I guess it's gotta be done, to geez, we've gotta do this. It's just that it's a slow, it's a slow, a slow movement. And um, when, like, like with cash, no, nobody has a clue what I do with my cash. I mean, you know, by and large, uh, with CBDC, it, it, it's it's always it's always traceable, always. And um, it, you know, except for the democratic, open norms that we try to have. That's the only safeguard we have. It's the only safeguard we have. We have nothing else. Thank you. <clears throat> Paul has a question. Yeah, uh, maybe it's kind of a question comment. Yeah, I'm not quite so cynical yet that I don't believe <laughs> <laughs> that the people can't be trusted through their elected government. Uh, but maybe- well, I, 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 I just want you to know, I believe 99.99% of the time they can be. I really do. <laughs> Maybe in a couple of years, <laughs> I'll get some more healthy cynicism. Um, so I've been having a conversation with, with Joseph Huber recently, and yeah. uh, I would definitely recommend people read his latest article on CDBC because I was very skeptical about it, and he kind of explained things. Uh, on shadow banking, I've had several discussions with him about that too. The way, he, and I think that we, I'm not sure, but I think we have to separate derivatives, which is the whole mess in 2008 and shadow banking. There's, I, I believe about $6 trillion of shadow bank money out there now in, in US. Um, I don't, you know, you go to a bed website and you pick out a number and you go to another website, it'd be completely different. Uh, but he considers shadow banking essentially to be embodied in money, mar money market funds. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's creating money is because a money market fund consists of you lending short-term money to businesses, corporations, very short term. However, that share, that share can be used to buy things. Oh yeah, so the oh, money is, it the, is. Money's at, the money is out there being spent, and your share is being spent. So he says you can have twice the amount of money. Now I said, well, why don't we just make a regulation that shares are non-negotiable? And he he's thinking about it. <laughs> You well, know, in other, in other words, you can't just say you have to sell the share, you have to trade it in for money, use that money, and then spend the money. You can't use the share to pay up for anything. So, that's exactly what, what uh, Macmillan, what, um, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. George and, and right. that, that's right. what they're saying, because right. the share is a financial asset. Right. And right. that cannot that cannot be used. So. Right. Yeah. Thank you. The next person who had a comment or a question is uh, Joe Polito, followed by Alec, then Ben. Hi, um, <clears throat> that was a great question by Lucille. And uh, I would just like to make a comment that <clears throat> there are advantages and disadvantages to every measure we take. And uh, I think for dozens of reasons, the CBDC would be advantageous and I'm not disputing that there are some disadvantages and risks, but it would take us a long way down the road. Uh, my question relates to the shadow banking, um, uh, a device that a lot of economists use to talk about money in our money system and the development of money is the goldsmith bankers. And basically what happened there was there were opportunities to mobilize resources to um, be, do productive things, but there wasn't enough money. And they found ways of creating more credit and, and getting things moving. Uh, and I know in the colonies, that was sort of the situation too. They found <laughs> ways of 
creating money and getting things moving. You know, Benjamin Franklin talked about this. So um, I think the way to look at the shadow banking problem is that if the government, if we're if if the government does gain control of our public utility money and it's generating enough uh, and spending a lot of it into the system as opposed to lending it in, then um, there won't be the need for these very creative ways of expanding the credit supply because the government will make sure that there is enough. Uh, the, the notion of um, uh, guaranteed jobs, make sure everybody's employed. The notion of um, uh, infrastructure changes. Uh, there's, a, there's quite a deficit in infrastructure, deficit in addressing the climate problem. So all those things are require the mobilization of resources and um, with the need act approach, those funds would be available. And if anything, uh, we would be taxed uh, by shortage of all these resources, including people. So in those situations, I think uh, the shadow banking would not find opportunities uh, to do things profitably because they'd be essentially crowded out in this full employment um, high priority economy that the government would be leading. Um, I think in World War II, I've heard that something like 50% of the resources were taken over by government in order to win the war. And uh, obviously they had to do a lot of measures, rationing and so forth to make it all possible. Um, so <clears throat> is, it, is it possible that notion of um, government design with the Need Act approach uh, would simply squeeze out the shadow banks. Yeah, I, I think so. Can, can I, I, interesting <clears throat> aside, which you reference, which I read this morning on a statistic. In 1943, the total car production in the United States was 139 cars. I thought you'd be interested in that. In 1950, seven years later, we produced 8 million cars. Anyway, interesting. I thought that, that really blew me away. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 the problem with the indirect <coughs> money creation, whether we're talking banking or um, shadow banking, is inequality. Massive pro cyclicality goes way overshoots, way undershoots, way overshoots, way undershoots. Um, and, and on the inequality side, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, um, I don't know who you are really, but when was the last time you were given the ability to create one or 10 or a hundred million dollars? I don't know, maybe, maybe that's who you are, and I just didn't know it. In that case, would you mind if we talk afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> I could really use your help. <laughs> uh, so those are the two of the issues. Um, I mean, what, what the Need Act and what generally what we're proposing is the system constrains at the top and adds at the bottom. Constrains at the top, adds at the bottom. So you get, yeah, you're still going to get some up and down, but not this, this crazy stuff that, that, that we're seeing. Um, <clears throat> Will there be constraint at the top? Yes, absolutely. But in the long term, in the long term, we gain. In the short term, yeah, it hurts. You say, well, holy cow, look at, look at everything that's happening, man. Dad, you know, if I could just have another $10 million, you know what I could do with that? Yeah, I know, but, but you know, five years later, you're likely to lose it all, so. Uh, I'm, exa I'm exaggerating a bit, but you got it. Yeah, very good. Okay, Alec has another question. Yes, uh, having to do with uh, using the tax system to fund the government. <clears throat> From what Uli and uh, uh, Joseph just finished saying, uh, it seems to me that the government can issue the money and not use taxes to um, fund its expenditures. Um, you know, you use the tax system in order to direct the market system to do what you want it to do. 
to, for example, impose taxes on uh, pollution and uh, subsidize uh, solar panels, do I know? Or whatever else you want to be doing. So you use the market system as an instrument for your goal, to attain your goals. And uh, for a short while, uh, I was looking for this article um, uh, that was published in 1946, in January 1946, but in American uh, Affairs by Beardsley Rummel, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And he uh, titles the article as, Taxes for Revenue Are Obsolete. Taxes for Revenue Are Obsolete. So use the money created by government in order to fund uh, the government's expenditure and not use taxes for that. I think that's really, really fundamental and that, uh, that would be where I would be going for. That money is a means, is not an end, and it uh, can be created at will. You know, there's that famous uh, story about uh, these uh, construction people, you know, they're building a building and they, uh, the, the top honcho comes back and says, we can't do it. We just can't build the building. We don't have enough inches. So, so. Well, well you'll, be happy to, you'll, be happy to, you'll be happy to know that, that, uh, that Congress just reinstated earmarks. Uh, isn't that wonderful? So uh, that's how we created the bridge to nowhere. That's the most famous <laughs> yes. example of multi-million dollar government spending. Um, th literally the bridge to nowhere. That, that's not an exaggeration. You know the bridge <laughs> and stop right there. Yes. Um, there's, there's not a good history of politicians uh, making choices based on general welfare when it comes to their own constituency. Uh, they have a phenomenal capacity um, to, you know, uh, this is what I want and this is what I'm going to get. Um, so, um, you know, does that grease the system? Last I heard, grease ain't all that good when it comes to politics. So uh, the, the taxes, they, they have a number of different purposes. One of which is it, it allows the public a general oversight of what the government does with the money. There is never enough money. There's no such thing in the world. Ne never will be, never has been. And so there have to be controls that are instituted. And uh, the, the problem is when the people who make the decisions are also the beneficiaries. You must always separate those two things. You can have money creation, and you can have beneficiaries. Don't ever put the two together. That's right. Should we talk about France in the 1700s? Shall we talk about Germany after? Well, that Germany after World War One. That's not. That's not a fair. That's not a fair example. Yeah. Um, on, I mean, there are so many examples. Those two have to be separated. We need both. We need beneficiaries. We need money creation. Don't bring them together. Very good. <clears throat> that's a comment on the corruption that we have now where Congress depends too much on finance. Yeah. We're hoping that after the NEED Act, the Congress will be so vulnerable to the financiers. Some of us over here. I would agree. Yeah. Um, ben has the next question and then John. What you just said kind of segues into one of my two questions that I've been saving up. Uh, you said that you, know, you don't want the decision makers to be the same people as the beneficiaries. And certainly nowadays, cronyism, the, the, that is not the case. The decision makers are, in many cases, the beneficiaries. And so when it comes to the government creating new money, from what I've gathered, you just want to give them straight to citizens to spend. Very libertarian idea. I, I like that. I understand that. But I know in AFJM, the NEED Act, we suggest that, you know, there be an independent monetary authority that creates this money that the government spends. Yes, so it does get spent by the government for the whatever objectives that, that the Congress um, deems appropriate and it 
come their authority comes from the people, yada, 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 all that. So it seems to me that if with the monetary authority was independent with a mandate that it creates this money for the government to spend with one sole objective in mind, that being um, inflation, that there wouldn't be a conflict of interest there. But it seems like you disagree with that part of the Need Act, um, the kind of like a lot of people here believe in. So I'm just curious as to why you might disagree with that. And yeah, I just opened up um, here. And I just want to thank you for coming out today. You've been a very good speaker. Thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, have a look at the chapter that I wrote. Chapter beats me. I don't know what it is. Uh, where I talk about money decision making. Um, what chapter is it? Chapter 11, money growth determination. I list hard conversations. Nixon forced, um, um, what's the guy's name? The, 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 the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank Walter. to, sorry? Walter? No, 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 Falker was 20 years later. Uh, uh, two, two, two guys later, Falker, uh, not 20 years later. Arthur uh, Burns. Thank you, Burns. Burns. Nixon forced Burns <clears throat> into a situation that it took until Falker to correct having to bring interest rates up to 20% for the simple reason that Burns, Nixon abused his position as a president. Let's talk about an independent monetary commission. <clears throat> Help me to understand who appoints that commission. The government, let me tell you, and they'll fire you. Uh, so Turkey, uh, they just got their third today, yesterday, today, I think, the, the, the third chairman of their central bank because the president doesn't like what they're, they're, they're doing. Okay, we can talk about Reagan. Same thing happened. Okay, and I have that in there also. That's on that side. Then I talk about Europe, where it's the reverse, where what happens is the, the, the ECB, the European Central Bank, is being used to force political decisions on governments, or they will not be funded. Yeah. Their banks will not be strengthened. So tell me how independent these things are. They're not independent. They're supposed to be independent, but they're less and less independent all the time. The, the top people are politicians. Don't kid yourself. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up, Ben, or not? Uh, um, no, I don't, actually. <laughs> Sorry about that. I get a little you strong on that You had two questions, Ben, didn't you? you well, yeah, that? but then I realized just never mind on my second question. It's just not. Oh, that's, <laughs> thank you. And that's, a, we like those passionate answers. That's what we like. Hey, John, what was your next question? Then well, we're I... gonna wrap it up and announce the next coffee houses. But John, we wanna have this first. Well, I can't help precede my question with a follow-up to what was just said. I don't think the politicians are the top dogs. Maybe the bankers are and the other people who fund them. But the politicians are often trapped. Um, they are. I agree. And, and and so I don't know who's the top dog here. But what I want what I want you to comment on quickly, Uri, is you have implied and even made explicit a couple of times about the sort of ecological implications of all of this economic stuff. And it seems to me that is essential, but it's not talked about very much. We haven't talked about it tonight, and you don't talk about it much in the book either. But the point is. If you can't have a system that is in, it, it, that can can approximate a steady state in terms of consumption and pollution, and so on, you don't have a system that's sustainable. No, and and it, it isn't the kind of system that you're talking about in terms of a sovereign money system in which you have no, money not created as debt is the only way you can get out of this trap, even in principle, of of, of essentially this this this. This, this drive toward growth will kill us all because it'll exhaust the planet. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you, John. It, does it solve all the problems? No. Do we still need to make right decisions? No. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, absolutely. Katarina, uh, her chapter is really good. Katarina Serafimova, uh, you should follow her. She, she's worked with the United Nations on ecological things. I mean, her whole, and uh, working in, uh, in, um, in Portugal, <laughs> Uh, as far as sustainable agricultural systems, the lady, the lady's really phenomenal. Um, yeah, the 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 sovereign money system stops the demand for growth. 
And like I just said, that doesn't solve all the problems, but boy, it, it sure makes a huge difference. Uh, it, it allows us from a sustainable perspective to say, what is, what is the optimum? What is the best? What will truly serve? Instead of driving ourselves through a debt-based system. I, I really, I really agree. Yeah, Karina's chapter. You know, I don't know what chapter it is. Katarina, there you'll be. It's uh, chapter 12. 12. And, and Yuli, if I might butt in, I was very charmed by this chapter and her reasoning. Uh, too bad it was Thank only you. 10 pages, but I, but I think she was one of the, the real pearls uh, in the yeah. book. Yeah. Um, What's the name of this author? Katarina Serafimova, and I'll, I'll put some information about her in the study stack. Uh, but yeah, she's wonderful, and her chapter 12 in Yuli's book, uh, yeah, a little pearl, which, which should or could be um, further uh, developed. Uh, or we can just invite her for a coffee house. Yeah, wow. yeah, oh, she's really good. That, that is a beautiful place, John. Thank you for that question. To, uh, to probably draw this conversation to a close, the idea that with all these variables, all these balls in the air and the many complicated things to think about, we have to think about each other and the environment and we're gonna have to get out of the debt-based system somehow. I like the way that you ended that up, that that's just gonna be one very big step towards sanity and possible healing. Uh, I've been very grateful for the conversation and I want to, there's been a lot of talk tonight about CBDC. Guess what? In May, the coffee house will be devoted to CBDC. It's on May 24th at eight o'clock Eastern, like these all are. Uh, the speakers will be Ben Reininger, who the young gentleman who just asked a very good question and Joe Bongiovanni, who has been quiet tonight, but who is here with us, um, will give us a super serious and super cool rundown on CBDC, where we're going, what might be good, what might be scary on May 24th. Before that, we have uh, the April Coffee House, which will be Dr. Mark Cass, is it Cassell or Castle? C-A-S-S-E-L-L. We think it's Castle. Castle. He's a professor of political science at Kent State University. He's the author of Banking on the State. It's the political economy of public savings banks. Uh, he'll talk about the very functional decentralized system of German savings banks. The Sparkassen, isn't that what they're called? Sparkassen. And the take and the takeaways from Germany's experience for efforts in the United States. So that's April 26th. Then May 24th, Ben Reininger and Joe Bon Giovanni on CBDC. So we hope to see every one of you here again, bring your friends. Um, Yuli, would you like to have the last word? Oh my goodness, there's 12 new messages here. Are there, is this people who wanna talk? No, I don't think so, uh, Mary. Their <laughs> comments. Oh, oh talking not, about cronyism. Not badly enough to extend the meeting. Okay, let's see how we're doing for time. We have four little minutes left. Dan, you you have something for four minutes, or should we should we wrap it up the way it is? Well, I just wanted to note that Uli's uh, Uli has a website with a contact. Um, Uli, it's ulikorch.com. And uh, you, you can contact him on that website. So I, I sent him a comment. I figured I'll just get hold of him directly. And, and uh, it's good to get on his mailing list and stuff as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's let Uli have the last word. And first, let me say personally, thank you very, very much. It's been enjoyable and helpful. Yes. Well, it's, it's mutual. Thank you, thank you so much. Great questions. Uh, you really think you understand your material. You, you're very <laughs> unusual in, in comparison to most of the people that, that I end up speaking to at conferences or with at, at, at different events. Um, 
So th this has been really enjoyable. I I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, you know, buy 10 copies of my book and give them to everybody. Let me, let me end with this. Maybe that'll be encouragement to you. People ask me all the time. It's interesting. You didn't ask me this one question you did not ask me. Hmm. Who was this? Maybe somebody did this. Somebody got close. Who was this written book actually written for? I'll tell you it was written for. It was written for five people. That's all I care about. The five people in some small country or two or three countries who can actually create those changes. So of course, friends of mine say, well, just send them to send your book to those five people for sake. Well, I just don't know who they are. That's the problem. So, yeah. <laughs> are you going to have it translated into Spanish? Yeah, that's I've already had had a request. So um, very good. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yes. Yeah, I just would add uh, at the IMMR meeting, the newest country uh, to join had representatives there. They were from Malaysia. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to send them um, or talk to the people in IMMR of which of those member organizations might fit, fit your, your criteria. Um, and the last thing I want to say on behalf of AFJM, Thank you very much for, for being here, for the work, and for engaging in this dialogue with us. Um, we are working hard, and it's so it's delightful that you two are, are working hard on this, <clears throat> um, and we're doing it together. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Lee. So very much appreciated. That was great.